on March 31st, 1962, at around 10 p.m., a family is walking down the cobbled empty streets of Darlinghurst, Sydney, Australia. There had been a string of attacks, likened to that of Jack the Ripper, taking place in the area. The usual drunk men and homeless people scattered throughout had all vanished and fear had taken over the streets. Sydney had never experienced this before. Killings happened, but these were more sadistic. Multiple bodies had been found, each with over 30 stab wounds. Investigating police had no trouble in linking the murders to the same unknown psychopath, now dubbed the Mutilator. The warped killer's crimes were easily recognised, as they all bore the same hallmark mutilation, and unlike Jack the Ripper, who targeted women, this perpetrator was hunting men at night. The young family are walking back home after visiting friends. The mother is pushing a pram that's echoing down the street as the wheels move along the cobbles. The father notices something down a side street. Darling, I think a man is lying on the road down there. Maybe he's been hit by a car. The father walked closer to the man on the floor. He could hear gurgling noises emanating from him and he found the man lying in what appeared to be a pool of his own blood. Panicked, the man rushed back to his family and they alerted the police. When they arrived at the scene, eerily, the body had vanished, but they did locate it just a few streets away. Someone had dragged the body and finished the killing. Officers found the body lying on the road, peppered with stab wounds to his face, neck and chest. Blood was everywhere and his pants had been pulled down to his knees, revealing what police expected to find. His genitals had been removed. The officer shouted to his colleagues, It's him. He's killed again. Before we start, if you find this video fascinating, then please drop it a like and leave me a comment below letting me know what you thought about the case. It helps the channel and don't forget to hit subscribe for more. Thank you. The serial killer who would become known as the Mutilator was born Allen Ginsberg, the middle of three children, in Liverpool, England, in 1924. He proved to be an unusual child, prone to taking long walks at night by himself. And on many occasions, his mother had to call the police to go and search for him. He never sought company and remained friendless all of his life. Psychiatrists diagnosed the young Ginsberg as being schizophrenic. In 1943, at the age of 19, he joined the army and was transferred to the Lancashire base, where he was forced upon in an air raid shelter by a corporal who threatened him with death if he told anyone. At first, young Private Ginsberg felt bad about what happened, but as time went by, he realized he enjoyed the physical experience and believed this was the start of his life as a homosexual. Being forced upon by the despised corporal would be constantly on Allen Ginsberg's mind throughout his life and play an important part in creating the horrific events ahead of him. After being discharged in 1947, he was institutionalized after being diagnosed with schizophrenia and he was treated with electroconvulsive therapy every day for six months until his mother fought for his release. Soon after, he was arrested for propositioning a police officer in a public toilet. His obvious homosexuality made life difficult in those conservative times, and he moved from job to job as taunts and ridicule became too much for him to cope with. He was also starting to worry about his sanity. Ginsberg consulted a psychiatrist in 1947 about his mental condition 
complaining that the persecution was causing illness and strange noises in his head. At the psychiatrist's recommendation, he spent the next three months in a mental institution, but it changed nothing. Disillusioned and convinced that his surroundings were to blame for his unstable mental condition, Kingsburg emigrated to Canada in 1949 and then to Australia in 1955, where he decided to start a new life completely and changed his name to William MacDonald. MacDonald had an interest in the macabre and idolised Jack the Ripper, and after arriving in Brisbane, he began to experience overwhelming urges to kill. In 1961, he chose Amos Hugh Hurst as his first victim. He befriended the 55-year-old Hurst outside the Roma Street Railway Station. They had a long drinking session together in a nearby hotel and went back to Hurst's hotel room, where they sat on the bed and drank beer. MacDonald would claim that he had no intentions of murdering Hurst when they went back to his room, but the urge to kill came on suddenly, and he squeezed his hands tightly around Hurst's neck. As he was being strangled, Hurst hemorrhaged, and blood spurted from his mouth all over MacDonald's hands. MacDonald punched him in the face, and Hurst fell to the floor, dead. MacDonald then undressed Hurst and put him in the bed. He washed the blood from his arms and quietly left the building and returned to his lodgings in South Brisbane. Terrified that any minute there would be a knock on his door from the police, William MacDonald looked in every paper every day for the story of the murder of Hurst, but no story appeared. Five days later, when he found Hurst's name in the obituary column, he couldn't believe his eyes. He said the man had died suddenly of a heart attack. MacDonald went about his newfound career as a murderer with added enthusiasm and bought a sheath knife and went looking around wine bars and sleazy hotels for another easy victim to kill. In a wine saloon full of down and outs, MacDonald met a man named Bill and the more they drank, the more Bill looked like the corporal who had forced himself upon MacDonald all those years before. At closing time, the pair took a couple of bottles of sherry to a nearby park for a drink. MacDonald's urge to kill was strong, but he waited until his drinking partner passed out drunk on the grass. Then, taking the knife from its sheath, he was just about to plunge the blade into Bill's neck when the urge left him. He sat on the man's chest with the knife raised, but the desire to commit murder had gone. He put the knife back in its sheath and went home, leaving the world's luckiest man to sleep off his hangover. He moved to Sydney in January 1961, where he took a job as a letter sorter with the postal department under the assumed name Alan Edward Brennan. Before long, he was well known around the parks and public toilets that were meeting places for Sydney's homosexuals. The first time McDonald's crimes came to the attention of law enforcement was on June 4th, 1961, when the new body of Alfred Greenfield was discovered in the toilet block of the Domain Baths. It wasn't long before the voices in McDonald's head were back, urging him to kill, and on the night of Saturday, June 4th, 1961, his career as the mutilator began, when he struck up a conversation with Greenfield. McDonald offered Greenfield, who was a homeless unemployed blacksmith, a drink from his bottle and lured him to the nearby Domain Baths on the pretext that he had more bottles in his bag, but there was more than just beer in his bag. McDonald had bought a brand new, long-bladed, razor-sharp knife, especially for the occasion. McDonald's urge to kill was strong, but he kept it at bay while he and Greenfield drank the rest of the alcohol. Eventually, Greenfield fell asleep, and this is when MacDonald pulled out his blade, put on his raincoat, and knelt over Greenfield's head, raising the blade above his head, and swiftly brought it down, 
Stabbing it deep into the victim's neck, he repeatedly plunged the knife into Greenfield again and again. The ferocity of the stabbings nearly decapitated Greenfield and the blood was everywhere. But fortunately, McDonald was already in his raincoat. He proceeded to remove Greenfield's trousers and underwear and lifted up his genitalia and chopped it off at the scrotum. He then put his knife inside his raincoat and put it in his bag and carried the amputated genitals to the harbour and threw them in the sea. The body was soon found and the following day the harrowing incident was in the media and it was said that it was the work of a maniac who the press now dubbed the mutilator. There was no direct motive for the police to chase. Who would do such a thing to this harmless, homeless man? Police did, however, feel confident of solving the case. The mutilation made them believe that it was a crime of passion and it was only a matter of time before the people involved would start to come forward. But they never did. The government put up an award of a thousand dollars for information leading to an arrest. But still, nothing came. There was no direct motive for the police to chase. A few months passed by and the panic had subsided and Greenfield became just another unsolved case. Until six months later, when another homeless man was found dead, stabbed ferociously multiple times with his genitalia missing, police knew for certain that they had a serial killer at large. On the morning of November 21st, 1961, McDonald purchased a knife with a six inch blade. The urges to kill were back and they were stronger than ever. McDonald was prowling the streets, looking for his potential next victim, when 41 year old Ernest William Cobbin came staggering his way. They both ended up in public toilets, drinking together. Openly, McDonald put his raincoat on as Cobbin was unaware of what was about to happen. As Cobbin was sat on the toilet seat, McDonald struck him with the six inch blade to the throat severing his jugular vein. Again, the mutilator swung the blade at him, this time like an uppercut, right along his chest, again to his neck, and then his face. In shock, Cobbin raised his arms in defense, but the mutilator was in a frenzied attack. He just kept stabbing the blade into his body, hitting his chest, neck, and face multiple times as well as his arms and his hands. By the time Cobbin hit the floor, he was dead, but the mutilator carried on stabbing him until he was too tired to do so. Once he stopped, he looked around the cubicle and admired how much blood was on the walls and the sheer horror of the scene. Like with the others, he pulled down Cobbin's trousers and pants, lifted up his genitalia and sliced it off at the scrotum. This time, he put it in a plastic bag. He again placed his knife inside his raincoat and put it in his bag, on his way out of the toilet and calmly washed the blood off his hands. He was becoming more confident. That evening, McDonald washed the genitalia with warm water before putting it in a fresh plastic bag and taking it to bed with him. The next day, he got the contents from the bag along with the knife and tied it to a brick and then threw it from the Sydney Harbour Bridge. On Monday morning, McDonald went back to his job of sorting letters under the alias of Alan Brennan, as if nothing had happened. Meanwhile, the headlines in the newspapers said, Mutilator strikes again. The police had received a phone call at 5.30 a.m. It was a man's voice. He said, there's a murdered man in the toilet in Moor Park opposite the Batten Ball Hotel and hung up never to be identified. The horror that the police confronted was unimaginable. Ernest Cobbin had been stabbed about 50 times. His genitals were missing. They had been sliced off as if by a surgeon. The toilet was also awash with blood. 
In the minds of authorities, there was no doubt that if anyone had walked in on the mutilator during the attack, they too would have been stabbed to death. A madman was on the loose and no one was safe. Again, police had no motives or evidence to follow up on. Cobbins was married with two kids, although at the time of the murder, he was separated and had turned to alcohol, but he did not appear to have any trouble or enemies. No physical evidence was found at the crime scene, so police staked out public toilets and other known haunts. Undercover police disguised as the homeless, the alcoholics and just the general down and outs. They were trying to see if the mutilator would befriend them, but it was all fruitless. For a time, McDonald thought his workmates suspected him of being the mutilator, but it was only his own paranoia. The thought of giving himself up to the police also crossed his mind, but he had to admit to himself that he enjoyed the killing too much to simply stop. As the months went by, the urge to kill again became overwhelming. Before we continue, I want to say thank you to the Empty Collection Instagram page for bringing this case to my attention. On their page, they have lots of unique true crime items. So head over to their Instagram and check it out at The Empty Collection. Thank you. On the morning of Saturday, March 31st, 1962, William McDonald purchased another long-bladed, razor-sharp sheath. He packed it in his bag with his raincoat and plastic bag. William McDonald was wearing his raincoat at around 10 p.m. as he followed Frank Gladstone McLean down past Darlinghurst Police Station. McDonald struck up a conversation with the drunken McLean and suggested that they have a drink. As they turned onto the cobbled street, the mutilator plunged the knife into McLean's throat. McLean was a tall, thin man, well over six feet tall, and could have easily fought the much smaller McDonald had he not been so drunk. McLean felt the knife sink deep into his throat and started to resist. The mutilator stabbed him again in the face and as McLean fell about trying to protect himself, the mutilator punched him in the face, forcing him off balance. As McLean fell to the ground, the mutilator was on him. He stabbed McLean in the head, neck, throat, face and chest until he thought he was dead. The mutilator was then panicked. He could hear a pram coming from a side street. He was not alone. He heard a baby's cry getting closer. He found a hiding spot where he could still see the body and he sees a man approach McLean. He inspects the body. McDonald is terrified the police will show up any second, but the man turns back and runs in the opposite way. When McDonald was sure that they had gone, he grabbed McLean by the legs and moved him to a different street. Saturated in McLean's blood, he lowered the victim's trousers and slicing the knife from the bottom in an upward stroke, sliced off Frank McLean's genitals. The mutilator peeked around the corner. Satisfied that no one was coming, he wrapped his knife and the plastic bag in the raincoat, put it in his bag and strolled away. He also took the bottle of sweet sherry that he and McLean had been drinking as it was covered in fingerprints. He passed several people along the way, but no one paid attention to him. Once McDonald was back home, he felt invincible. Again, before bed, he washed the genitalia in warm water and took it to bed with him. He felt victorious. Things were not going quite so well for William McDonald in his private life. In totally unrelated incidents, he had a severe falling out with his landlord and in the same week he got the sack from his mailing sorting job at the postal department. But Donald had saved a lot of money over the years and he decided to go into business for himself. Still using the assumed name Alan Edward Brennan, he bought a mixed business in Burwood, an inner western suburb of Sydney. In his little shop, he made sandwiches and sold a variety of small goods. The shop was also an agency for a dry cleaning company. 
MacDonald loved it. He had no landlord standing over him and he didn't have to answer to anyone at work. He lived in the residence above the business and for the first time in his life, he was left alone. So when the urge to kill came on him again, the mutilator didn't have to worry about the risk of being caught doing his thing in a public place. He could bring his victims home and have his way with them there. The urge to murder and mutilate came again stronger than ever. And one night, early in November 1962, William MacDonald went to a wine saloon called the Wine Palace in the heart of downtown Sydney, looking for a victim. Here, he met 42-year-old James Hackett, a petty thief and homeless man who had only been out of jail for a couple of weeks. MacDonald took Hackett back to his new residence and continued drinking until Hackett passed out on the floor. The mutilator used a knife from his delicatessen to stab the sleeping Hackett. On the first plunge, the long knife went straight through Hackett's neck. But incredibly, Hackett woke up and shielded the next blow with his arm, thus diverting the knife into the mutilator's other hand, cutting it badly. With blood pouring from the wound in his hand, the mutilator unleashed renewed homicidal rage on Hackett. He brought the knife down with both hands and plunged it through Hackett's heart, killing him instantly. The floor was awash with blood, but still the mutilator attacked Hackett's body with the knife until he had to stop for breath. He sat in the pool of blood beside the body, puffing and panting. There was blood everywhere. It was splattered all over the walls and the ceiling and it had collected in big puddles on the floor. The mutilator bandaged his hand with a dirty dishcloth and set about removing Hackett's genitals. But the knife was now blunt and bent from the ferocity of the attack. Too exhausted to go down to the shop to get another one, the mutilator sat covered from head to toe in blood, hacking away at Hackett's scrotum with the blunt bent blade. He stabbed the penis a few times and made some cuts around the testicles before finally giving up and falling asleep where he sat. In the morning, the mutilator woke to find himself covered in sticky, drying blood. He was lying next to the victim, Hackett. The pools of blood had soaked through the floorboards and threatened to drip onto the counters of the shop. The mutilator had a bath, cleaned himself up and went to the hospital where he had stitches put in his hand. He had told the doctor that he cut himself in his shop. It took McDonald the best part of the day to clean up the mess. The huge pools of blood on the lino couldn't be scrubbed out and he had to tear it up he also removed all of Hackett's bloody clothing, leaving only the socks. MacDonald dragged the dead and naked Hackett underneath his shop and left him there. Every few hours, he went back to the body and dragged it a little further into the foundations of the building until it was jammed into a remote corner of the brickwork, out of view and almost impossible to see. MacDonald left all of Hackett's bloodied clothing with the corpse. MacDonald panicked when he finally sat down and thought about what he had done. He thought that the police would come looking for Hackett. Only a few of the bloodstains had come off the walls and there was blood all over the floorboards. If the police even came to ask him a question, he would be caught. And then there was the cab driver who had driven them to the shop on the night of the murder. He would have remembered them. Paranoid and terrified, William MacDonald packed his bags and caught a train to Brisbane, where he moved into a boarding house, dyed his graying hair black, grew a moustache and assumed the name Alan MacDonald. Every day, he bought the Sydney newspapers, expecting to read of the murder of Hackett and how police were looking for a man named Brennan in connection with the mutilator murders. But as the days turned into weeks and months, there was no mention of any body or any search for missing Brennan. MacDonald was beside himself with worry. Had police found the body 
and set a trap for him? Would they knock on his door at any minute? The mystery of it all was driving him crazy. However, although he didn't know it, William MacDonald didn't have a worry in the world. He had been declared dead. No one was looking for a dead man. A few days after MacDonald left for Brisbane, customers wanting to pick up their dry cleaning had become concerned that no one was at the shop. Neighbours assumed that the nice Mr Brennan had left without telling anyone. After three weeks, a putrefying smell was coming from the vicinity of the empty shop. After a month, the smell was so overwhelming that neighbours called the health department, who in turn called the police to break the door in. The smell in the shop was hideous. It led police to the rotting body of Hackett. The corpse was so badly decomposed and mauled by rats that it was impossible to identify. At this stage, police assumed it was the body of the missing shop proprietor, Alan Brennan, who had crawled under his shop for reasons known only to himself and electrocuted himself. Police had no reason to suspect foul play. Everything was normal. It looked like an accidental death. The body was buried in a pauper's grave under the name Alan Edward Brennan. When his workmates at the PMG read of the unfortunate demise of their old workmate in the death notices, they collected for a wreath and attended the small memorial conducted by a local funeral director. Inarguably the most extraordinary circumstances in Australian criminal history, William MacDonald, the man who had committed five atrocious murders, was a free man if only he had known it. And if he had never gone back to Sydney, he may have well been a free man for the rest of his life. Unaware that he was supposedly dead and buried, MacDonald stayed a short time in Brisbane before going to New Zealand, still in the belief that the police would be looking for him. But the urge to kill was still with him and it was getting stronger every day. He had to kill again, and for reasons known only to himself, he had to return to Sydney to do so. On April 22nd, 1963, John McCarthy was in town, enjoying the sunshine and shopping for a few items. When he bumped into a former postal colleague, the problem was that this colleague was the same man found dead in his shop. John had even delivered a memorial wreath to his grave. McCarthy nearly died of shock as he had no idea that the murdered Hackett had been buried as the missing Brennan. MacDonald was surprised when his old work friend was so stunned to see him. You're supposed to be dead, McCarthy told MacDonald. What do you mean, MacDonald said. They found your body underneath your shop at Burwood. We went to your funeral service. But if you're alive, who was the body under your shop? And why did you run away? As it dawned on MacDonald what had happened, he ran away down the street. John tried to report this encounter to the police, but they dismissed it. Next, he tried the press. A journalist was intrigued and ran the story under the headline, Case of the Walking Corpse. This story went big and forced the police's hand into exhuming the body and they did new tests including fingerprints which revealed the body was not Alan Brennan but a man named Patrick Joseph Hackett. He was also named as a victim of the mutilator due to his removed genitals. Police released an image of Alan Brennan to the press and got it circulating nationwide. He was quickly identified in Melbourne on May 13th, 1963. Police encircled and arrested the man. He quickly gave a full confession. Alan Brennan revealed his legal name to be William MacDonald and admitted to being the killer they knew as the mutilator. In September 1963, William MacDonald stood trial for the murders and pleaded not guilty based on insanity. He then testified in such detail about his killings that it caused several jury members to faint. He was found guilty of murder 
the judge handed down five consecutive life sentences with the recommendation that McDonald is never to be released. On May 12, 2015, William McDonald died in Long Bay Hospital at 90 years of age. Whilst in prison, he was asked why did he murder those men? I didn't murder those men. Physically, I did. There's no doubt about that. But it is this other person who lives inside me that actually killed him. As a young boy, I was diagnosed as a schizophrenic, and I still am today. Schizophrenia means split personality, and it was my other personality that killed those men as an act of revenge on the soldier who took my soul. I then mutilated each one in a manner so that he couldn't do what he did to me ever again. That's all we got time for in this episode. Until next time, stay sane.